Why don't you rise with it? Amen. Let's stand on our feet. In Christ alone. Give it.
read some verses this morning. These verses have been in my heart all week long from Luke 24, beginning with verses 13 through 18. We're going to read select verses. This is the story of the road to Emmaus. Read with me, please. Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all of these things which had happened. So it was, while they conversed and reasoned, that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And he said to them, What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And reading down in verse 25, Then he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things, and to enter into his glory. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. In verse 32, And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? You know, I used to think how wonderful it must have been to be there on that road and to have him opening the scriptures and teaching all that the prophets, all that Moses, all that the Psalms had written of himself. But the reality is, he walks with us and he talks with us. We have that same privilege and that same opportunity as these disciples had on the Emmaus Road. Amen. God is going to open his word and speak to us this morning. So open your hearts. And as we sing this last song in the garden, preparing the heart for that. Amen. Yeah. 
thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy, O oh God. And we give you everything we have just to give back, Lord. And we just thank you for your anointing on this service and this time together. We pray for your blessing throughout the rest of the service. And we wait in expectation on your spirit to move today. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Uh, it's a couple of announcements this morning. Uh, first of all, we're actually uh, we're going to be doing our regular tithes and offerings here in a few moments, but uh, later in the service, we will actually be doing our compassion offering. Uh, we take this twice a year, and uh, for those of you not familiar with uh, our compassion uh, locally here, uh, it's a fund that's set up to, uh, to help people who come in times of need. Sometimes people may need assistance with groceries, some uh, uh, rents. I, help with gasoline, all things like that. And uh, by the generosity of the people here at this church, we are able to get a hand up to uh, people in our, when they go through times of need. And, uh, and it's just been a blessing that so many families over the years that we've been able to help during that time. And we just uh, ask again, um, not when we take our offering here, but later on there will be an offering specifically for that. So if you had not planned ahead of time, you have... Uh, Time in between that you'll be able to either write out a check or cash and just mark on your envelope compassion fund when we take that offering as well. So that's a great way we can give back to help uh, people in our church and even in our community uh, when they uh, go through some struggles from time to time. Uh, also tonight, 6 o'clock at Loudermilk uh, Beach is our baptism service. Uh, I think last count, uh, I think we have about 12 people. We're going to be baptized tonight. Um, if you've been playing with that idea, you can still get in. Uh, so anyone in here, if you have talked to us about being baptized, or even if you haven't and you really want to, right after service, uh, right up here at front, <coughs> Pastor Mark's going to be meeting with you, going over some of the things you need to keep in mind tonight, how things will, will go. And uh, any final questions you may have, that would be the time to ask. I do know also, uh, uh, Pastor Sheriff, someone had asked once that uh, they had been baptized many years ago, and you know things in life just kind of happen, but they have since God did a new work in their lives, and they feel more on fire now than they have, and ask that they'd be all right to be baptized again. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. If, you, uh, if you're in that spot where you feel like, man, it's been many years, and things have changed in my life, and I'd like to rededicate that, we will baptize you if that's what you want to do as a testimony to God. Uh, so tonight, uh, 6 o'clock, those of you familiar with the uh, Louder Road Park there, there's some volleyball courts and a gazebo off on the far right side. Just go straight back from there. That's where we'll meet. We'll be doing the baptisms pretty early. Uh, then if you want to bring some food, uh, bring some chair, just kind of hang out, a little fellowship, and watch the sunset together. And all in all, it'll be a great night. So we encourage you, life groups as well, uh, bring everybody down to the beach, and let's celebrate with those being baptized tonight. Amen. And with that, uh, Ralph Bressel is going to come up, our treasurer, and he's going to give us uh, our treasurer's report. <coughs> On an annual basis, uh, I, I get up and I try to give you some information about what's going on with our church finances. And um, I, I thank you for giving me an opportunity to be your treasurer. Um, as a, as a CPA, um, I, I do this for a living, uh, and I don't normally enjoy doing it when I'm not <laughs> doing my normal business stuff. And I will say that although uh, there's work involved, um, what's, what's amazing to me is to see how God blesses us as a body. Uh, so I just want to read for you. I think you're, whether you're going to get it this week or next, you're going to get a, a composite of all the reports from the different people who were saying things. And so I'm just reading what is in that report. You will get a copy of that uh, later on. I'm presenting you to you uh, the annual treasurer's report to the church for the year ending March 31, 2014. The information compiled for this report includes all transactions, that's an accounting term by the way, all transactions through the end of the fiscal year ending March 31. 2014. During this past year, our tithes and faith promise collections totaled $346,802. I'm 
I don't round off. I round off the pennies, but not the dollars. So write all that down if you need to. This is $11,577 less than we, re we received last year. $11,577 less than we received the year before. With a full year of expenses for our youth pastor <coughs> and his wife, our children's director, John and Lindsay, as well as the continued increase in our property insurance and other expenses, we are in a fairly tight financial position. Our weekly needs for the church operations. By the way, if you look at the back of your, your uh, bulletin, you'll find what our needs are and what our uh, monies that are given from the prior week are. But if you would just write this number down in your mind, our weekly needs for church operations are approximately $7,300. This past year, we took in approximately $6,670 in tithes and faith promise offerings, which turns into $630 less than we need weekly. Now, on the expense side, we had a budget of $402,000, $402,603 for this past year. We actually spent $378,281, which is $24,332 less than the budget. I know some of you people, you salesmen especially, are just going, oh, this is way too much for me. But those of you who like the counting numbers, you follow along. Let me mention here that we have extremely responsible people who take very seriously the spending of the church's funds. And, and I do want to emphasize that. We have people who are responsible for various budgets. They prayerfully consider each and every expense that they pay for, that they deal with, that they approve. Many times, they have concerns about their own budget. They take money out of their own pocket to pay for expenses of the church because they see issues arising within the budget. So we're very, very thankful to have these people, responsible people, being responsible for the church's money that you give. God knows their hearts. And we should be thankful for their giving hearts. The bottom line is that we spent $31,479 more than we took in the year. Fortune, that was really, we took in, remember, $346,000. We spent $378,000. Fortunately, we had cash saved from previous years to cover the shortfall. Our available cash on hand, including market money or money market funds, uh, was thirty-five thousand five fifty-two at the end of March, and sixty-eight thousand ninety-five dollars at the end of March in two thousand thirteen. Our goal is to have three months worth of expenses as a surplus in available cash, which would be ninety-four thousand nine hundred dollars. So we're about sixty thousand dollars shy of what our goal would be. I have confidence in God to provide. He knows our needs before we do. He has provisions to provide for our needs. I just ask that each of us, members, non-members, those who attend, prayerfully consider doing what God lays on your heart to do. I want to speak briefly on three additional items. Um, number one, special fund giving for the air conditioning units. Second one is special fund giving for Trevecca matching fund. And the three, and number three is alternate, alternate source of funding, a security account. One of the special funds that our church board has set up for targeted giving is the air conditioning fund. Now targeted giving is you write, if you don't write anything on your little envelope that you put your funds, it goes into regular tithes and offerings. If you target where you want it to go, and it's a part of a fund that we have created as a church board, that money will specifically go targeted to that particular fund. So that, that's pretty cool that, that you can give towards that. And we encourage you beyond your normal ties and gifts that you give to those type of funds. Anyway, we have over 20 air conditioning units uh, cooling our three buildings and approximately 12 
to 15 of them are very old. Um, they are being maintained quite well, but in time, old air conditioning units in Florida die. This past year, we spent $6,900 on two new air conditioning units, and we, we received uh, only $3,931 specifically for the fund. So we had to borrow from our regular fund to pay for these air conditioning units. If you're looking for additional giving needs uh, with your tithe, think of the air conditioning fund. The second fund is the Trevecca Nazarene Matching Scholarship Fund. This fund is just that, providing scholarship funding of up to $250 a year for each student who attends Trevecca from our church. The university will provide up to $500 matching for each student. This fund is depleting rapidly and needs replenished. Prayerfully consider what you may be able to do to help build up this fund so our students can benefit by a total of $750 when we as a church provide only $250 of it. Finally, a member came to me a couple months ago and wanted to contribute stock to the church, which would be turned into cash immediately. We do not speculate on stocks or anything of that nature. Uh, we thought through this, and he helped directing us with this, set up a securities account, which allows us to set up the process for this to work. The unique thing about this is that once the funds are provided, the stock is provided in this account, it immediately turns into cash and comes into our, account, our checking account. And the other unique thing is that the donor, the person who contributes the stock to the church, takes the donation, the tax donation, for the full value of that stock. And the church takes the cash into their account tax-free. Pretty cool. Because the donor does not cash in the stock, he doesn't have a taxable event. Because the church is tax-exempt, they don't owe tax on the transaction. It's a win-win. The church benefits the donor benefits. If you would like additional information on this, please contact myself or our church secretary, Chris Shelley. Finally, as I say, each year, each, uh, each, of, each year has, every year has its own challenges. With God in control, and each of us responding as he leads, no matter what comes up, we know that with God, all things are possible. Amen. We have a very loving and a very giving church. As the need arises, God's people will provide. Thank you all for all you do in making this a wonderful place to come and worship. Respectfully submitted, Ralph Bressler, treasure. Amen. Um, we definitely appreciate all the uh, time and work Ralph uh, puts into that. It's uh, not an easy task to do, but he does a phenomenal job at it, and we do appreciate uh, his services in that way. So, uh, if you get a chance to see him, just uh, give him a thank you for all he does because he uh, puts time into it because he loves his church, and uh, we want to be good stewards of what God gives us. Yeah. Um, I do um, just want to make one uh, clarification with the Torveca scholarships. What we used to do, we would do the 250, and then the school would match, they'd add 500, make it the 750. Well, recently the board decided because Trevec will actually match up to 500. So as the next school year starts and stuff, I think this past semester we added to, but um, students who go to Trevec will receive 500 from the church. And then Trevec adds an additional $1,000 on top of it. So students are getting $1,500 toward tuition. And uh, so uh, by the faithful giving us being able to pay budgets, that's how... Uh, we're able to send the students there, but also them get a lot more money. And, uh, you know, 1500 is a lot better than 750 And uh, so we'll take advantage of that. And that's why um, that this past year we had five students up at Trevecca. Um, so it's one of those things, you know, I know we'll have at least, I think we have two graduating this year, but there's always more that we may end up going. And uh, that's something we want to be prepared for because we believe in helping out our college students. Amen? Amen. All right, with that, ushers.
Prepare to come as we give our morning tithes and offerings. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for the people in this church that have faithfully given. And our Lord, as we read the report, we know that um, there's may have been some shortfalls this past year, but God, you are our provider. We trust in our need that you will be there to supply it. And as we give this morning, Lord, may you bless this offering and bless the givers as you continue to move this church forward. And we just thank you for your abundance and your grace, Lord. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you all very much. We appreciate uh, those leading our worship. Amen? Amen. That's great. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Well, each year we elect a brand new church board. And this year we've elected a new church board. And we appreciate those that are willing to serve. And we have a ceremony now where we install them. And they become uh, leaders in the church. And so the newly elected church board, I invite you to come and stand here at the front facing me, if you would, at this time. Come forward, and we will now do the installation of the new board. I asked them to uh, memorize this whole page, but just in case they didn't, I've got it to pass out to them. No, I'm just kidding. Face, face the uh, front of the sanctuary here. Take one and pass them down. Face me, if you would. Let's... Let's get this ready. You have before you a covenant, and these are people that are willing to serve, and a covenant is based on trust. A contract is based on mistrust. A covenant means that these people are standing here before you as your elected church board members, and are saying that they will be faithful to do all they can to represent the Lord and faithfully be stewards over this church. And we appreciate that. Amen? Amen. If you'll take that covenant now, and you're going to begin to read that in unison, I'll get you started. And it starts where it says, in consideration. Let's read together. <laughs> in consideration of the confidence placed in me by the church, selected office I now assume, I hereby covenant to maintain a high standard of Christian living, an example in harmony with the ideals and standards of the Church of the Nazarene, to cultivate my personal Christian experience by setting aside each day definite time for prayer and Bible reading, to be present at Sunday school or life group. Sunday morning preaching services and Wednesday night ministries to attend faithfully all duly called meetings of the various boards, councils, or committees to which I have been or will be assigned to notify my superior officer if I am unable to be present at the stated time or to carry out my responsibilities in this office to read widely the denominational publications and other books and literature which will be helpful to me in discharging the duties of my office, to improve myself and my skills by participating in equipping opportunities as provided and able, to endeavor to lead people to Jesus Christ by manifesting an active interest in the spiritual welfare of others and by attending and supporting all evangelistic meetings in the church. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father God, the people that are standing here have been faithfully called and elected by this church body and a trust has been given to them. And it is a trust to build the kingdom of God to put their eyes on Jesus Christ and to follow Him with all of their hearts. The covenant that they have made, Lord, by Your Spirit and power, Your anointing, they will carry out to the best of their abilities. We thank You for Your love for them and Your equipping of them. May we be faithful and may we work with all of our hearts until the day that You return and we see You face to face. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Church board, having pledged together your hearts and your hands to the task of caring for the work of this church in your particular assignment, I herewith install you in the respective positions to which you have been elected or appointed. You are now a vital part of this organizational and leadership structure of the church. May you by example, by precept, and by diligent service be effective workers in the vineyard 
of the Lord. Amen. Turn and face the congregation, if you would, church board. Now I ask the congregation to stand, if you would, please. All standing. You have heard the pledge and the covenant entered into by your church leaders for the coming year. I now charge you as a congregation to be loyal in your support of them. The burdens which are laid upon them can be heavy at times, and they will need your assistance and your prayers. May you always be understanding of their problems and tolerant of their seeming failures. May you lend assistance joyfully when called upon, so that as we work together, our church may be an effective instrument in winning the loss to Christ. Let's bow our heads for a prayer. We stand as the body of Christ. You are the head of the body. Lead on, O King Eternal. May your vision be fulfilled. May you lead your flock into green pastures. May you feed the flock. May you increase the flock. Bless the flock. And Lord, may we work faithfully for you and with you and alongside you, filled with the anointing and Spirit of God, until the day that you return and we see you face to face. And may we together hear the word of the Lord that says, Well done, good and faithful church. And we will give you glory and honor and praise you forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated in church board. You may return to your seats. Thank you. We're getting ready now to take the compassion offering. And the ushers, if you prepare, Pastor John. Ushers, come forward once again. Now this offering is for our compassion offering. Lord God, we ask as we give this compassion offering this morning that we give generously to help those in need as you have called us to uh, look upon our fellow brothers and sisters who are in need and that we can help them out in those times and but as we offer a hand up to people to strengthen them in their time of need, that though we do this out of your love and of your mercy as well, that we can take care of each other as you have instructed us. And I pray that you bless this offering and may you multiply it many times over so we can continue to meet the need of those in our body and in our community. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Forgiveness, I'm 
invite you to take your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 3, Matthew chapter 3, and I'm going to begin reading at verse 13, Matthew 3, 13. Let's stand in honor of God's Word, shall we stand? Matthew chapter 3, beginning at verse 13. The word of the Lord. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to detour him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love, with him, I am well pleased. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, increase our understanding of your word, of you the living word. Make this something significant in the life of our church family and those that are being baptized, presenting themselves for baptism this evening. Those that, uh, of us here that are here that remember the day that we presented ourselves to be baptized. We thank you, Jesus Christ, for your great mercy. We thank you that you identify with a sinner, repenting and turning to you. We thank you that you love us and know us by name. You have all things in control. We pray that you'll use your word for your glory now. Build up your church. May someone turn to you today. And we're going to give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I want you to see here that, uh, first of all, it's quite obvious that John the Baptist felt very unqualified. None of us here are qualified to represent Jesus Christ except for his anointing. Uh, notice that God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the call. And John the Baptist was a man living outside and wearing clothing made of camel skin and eating locusts and wild honey. And when people would see him, they would say, wow, that guy's radical. He looks like a wild man. John the Baptist was faithful to the call of God. And he didn't feel qualified. Here came Jesus Christ. Here he is baptizing. And he looks up. And there stands Jesus. I want to remind you this morning that we're not called to be successful. We're called to be faithful. And John the Baptist was faithful. We went to Wachula yesterday and saw the presentation of Noah. Beautiful presentation. And throughout that, we were reminded that Noah was just a simple man of the land. He was a farmer. And God called him to build an ark, a life-saving device. And God used a simple man like Noah. And I'm sure throughout, Noah said, why me? We think of Joseph, the father of Jesus, that he was a carpenter. And he was asked to raise Jesus, to be a father to him, here on this earth, and I'm sure that Joseph many times said, why me? We think of the disciples of Jesus Christ. They weren't particularly learned men as far as scholastical degrees and a degree of success, and they probably said, why me? When I think of the church of Jesus Christ, we're, we're all like John the Baptist. We're not worthy. But God uses people just like us. I'm reminded of a couple that we had come to our church when I pastored uh, in Ohio. 
Robert and Nancy Resendez. And Nancy, when she got saved, she began to tell all of her friends about Jesus Christ. She wasn't uh, qualified as far as educational degrees to, to be a, a minister, but yet the qualifications are the anointing of God Almighty. And she began to tell her friends and her family. And I report to you that Nancy's, pretty much her entire family that lived there in that town, gave their lives to Christ. And her friends gave their lives to Christ. And Nancy said, when we have this baptism, Pastor, is there any way that we can use our pool? I would be honored if we could use our pool. I said, great. And on that particular uh, evening, when we had that baptism, 25 people baptized, and about 21 of those were Nancy's family and friends that she had shared Jesus Christ with. John the Baptist wasn't qualified. He sees Jesus and says, I can't do this. I can't baptize you. I think of the church of Jesus Christ, the board that we're standing here, the church board. None of us are qualified. You're people who faithfully give. You give out of your wallet. You give out of your purse. You use your cars and vans and you use the Bible to share the word of God and you open up your homes and you use your hands and your hearts and all of that is used to build the kingdom of God. And we say, why me? My favorite Sunday school teacher, Bob Burgess. I was reminded of him this week being at the Lake Placid in a finance committee meeting. And we were talking about how some of our ministers had been ordained and we made an exception for Bob. Bob, up in his latter years, after completing a vocational calling, felt that he wanted to go through the minister's course of study and he wanted to faithfully do everything that was needed. And so the, he, he came towards the end of his life and was struggling physically to stay alive and was just a little bit short of the requirements to finish and be an ordained minister in the church of the Nazarene. And the particular board that was granting that made an exception so that Bob could be ordained. And it was just a short amount of months after Bob was ordained that then his life was expired and he went on to heaven. Bob was the best Sunday school teacher I ever had. I couldn't wait to get there on Sunday morning. I would get up on Sunday mornings at about 1 o'clock and would start a newspaper out delivering 1,400 newspapers and sometimes they were 6 pounds on Sunday morning with three inserts, the Kansas City Star and Times. And I had two or three guys working with me and for me, and we completed those routes. And I would rush home and get a quick shower, and, and I would not miss Sunday school because I wanted to get into Bob's class. And Bob would share a lesson, and it was the most beautiful lesson, and it was right down to earth, right where we lived. And I will admit I appreciated that he served donuts and coffee. <laughs> Bob would open up his home. Lisa and I, as... Newlyweds, we along with other people could come to his home and use his pool table and sit on his couch, get in his refrigerator, and Bob and Beverly Burgess, two of the most precious people. Bob was a Sunday school teacher. He made his living and made a good living in the food industry. I enjoyed deer hunting some with Bob Burgess. I enjoyed going to his home. We did some great things together. What a wonderful man of God. Bob only had an eighth grade education, but he had the anointing of God on him. John the Baptist stands here and says, I am not worthy to do this. Let me tell you something. I'm not worthy to preach the Word of God. There are times that I want to just you know, why do they have big pulpits so if the minister has to, he can get down behind it and just crawl down there and hide? <laughs> None of us are worthy. We're not worthy because of who we are. We stand with the anointing of God. And God uses us. There's a song that says, little is much when God is in it. That doesn't mean that we don't bring our very best. Anything we do for the Lord, we should do the very best. Amen? Amen? But little is much when God is in it. And God used the Bob Burgess in a great way. I remember as a teenager growing up, 
a couple named Tony and Judy Way. All Tony and Judy Way basically did was just open up their homes so the teenagers could come and hang out. We got some people in the church here that do that. Things don't always look the same when a group of teenagers leave your home, do they? And Tony and Judy Way just opened up their home and we went and enjoyed and had fellowship and had a safe place to hang out and it had a great impression on us. When I think of people who are Christ-like in the church, I think of the Tony and Judy Ways, the Bob and Beverly Burgess, the John the Baptist. He said, I'm not worthy to do this. My grandmother, Pauline Cook, right up until her mid-80s, she was still directing children's church. She was still playing the piano at a Christian school when they did their music in their chapel. She was still writing tracts and passing out tracts to people and telling about Jesus Christ. Not worthy, but God uses us. I think of you, Naples First Church of the Nazarene. You are the church. It's not my church. You are the church. We are the church of Jesus Christ. And if you are somewhat of an attender, or partial attender, or seasonal attender, or all the time here, you are a part of this church. None of us are worthy. This is the church of Jesus Christ, and the only one is worthy is the one who hung and died on the cross for us and rose again from the dead. And we look to Him. And we, like John the Baptist, say, we're not worthy, but we take the tools that He's given us. We open up our wallets and give them compassion offering. And someone gets some medicine and someone gets some groceries. They don't come repeatedly. They don't show up on the doorstep again and again. We pray with them. We counsel with them. We desire to give them a hand up, not a handout. And we bless them and we always give in the name of Jesus Christ. You don't even see what happens behind these doors and out in the ministry of this local church. It's going forward. It's going out. It has an influence. It has a reach into this community. And not just this community, but all over the nation and all over the world. Amen? You've got a young man in Ethiopia today filming a movie that will hopefully be used for the glory of God. There he is in Africa with two filmers putting a film together. And you, as a church, have supported that ministry, right, Nature? Yeah. Ralph came and told about the things we've done as a church and the others giving in Trebekah Nazarene University. And you support retired missionaries and pastors. And you support a ministry in 159 countries all over the world. You're a part of that ministry. None of us are worthy. But God uses us. And little is much when God is in it. Amen. And here's John the Baptist. Wrapped in camel skin. Locusts and honey. And here he is. Jesus stands before him to be baptized. And he says, I can't do this. Me? Me baptize you? Then we come to the question. Why was Jesus baptized? Why would the Son of God, who knew no sin, be baptized? Now you know what baptism is. This was a baptism of repentance. The people in that day understood baptism. Baptism was somewhat of a common thing that happened. If the Jews were to get somebody into the Jewish faith and the Judaizers would convert them, they would have a, an initiation of water. And here we have a baptism of repentance. John, when he preached, he preached about this baptism. This was about repenting of sin. You know what repentance is. It's a turn from our sin to God. It's more than weeping tears and feeling sorry and, and saying, oh, I've been so bad and, and all of that. It is a change of heart. Amen? Amen. Baptism is saying, I'm not living that way any longer. Christ Jesus has entered me. I am a new creation in Christ. I'm not going to be that way. The old Mark, the old Don, the old Steve, the old Susie is gone. Amen? Amen. And now I'm a new creature in Christ. Amen. It's a baptism of repentance. Why would Jesus come for that? 
It's also to show that I'm following God with all my life. I want to make a public statement here that I'm following God. And God's the Lord of my life. It also is a reminder that the water has a washing effect. And the water is symbolically washing away the sins of my life, which has already happened in my life. Christ has washed away my sins. And now the water is symbolic of that washing. And then it's a reminder of the resurrection. As I go down in the water and I come back up, I come back up to new life in Jesus Christ. The old is gone, the death to the old, and rising to the new. Isn't that beautiful? What an optimistic note. As I come to church on Sunday morning, I sit and I listen to the songs and I hear the testimonies and see what is shared. I think, this is what the world needs. What an optimistic note. You know that one of the features of Christianity is its radical optimism. We live in a world where people are told you'll always be that way. We live in a world that suppresses and complains and criticizes and critiques, but in the church we find the radical optimism of God Almighty that He can take what is not possible in man's eyes and do a radical miracle. Amen? Amen. And we have Jesus come in here. John has been preaching about repentance. He's warning them. We need more warnings. Do not hope and pray that your pastor and Pastor John and your spiritual leaders, your life group leaders and your Sunday school, do not hope and pray that they always make you feel good when you leave their presence. Amen? Amen. There are times we need to be desperately warned. And John, as he preached, he said, the Lord is coming. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is coming. And I warn you, you must repent. You must get yourselves ready. I tell the church today, when Jesus Christ returns, he's not looking for a group of people that have got off the straight and narrow and took the exit road called sin. The Bible says, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. He will return for the spotless bride of Christ, a holy people who are following him with all of their hearts. And John the Baptist, as he is preaching, he is saying, repent, turn from your wicked ways. Repent and turn from your wicked ways. He is preaching with an urgency. And I say to you, church, today, Jesus Christ will return. And He is coming very soon. It could happen tonight. And once He comes, it is too late. We have to be ready to meet Him. Amen? Amen. Don't wait. Young people that are here, don't say, well, you know, at a certain time in my life, I don't get things settled with God. Now is the day of salvation. And if Satan is trying to fight you back now, how much more do you think he'll fight you back? Somebody says, well, I'll have a deathbed conversion. All of hell will try to keep that from happening. But thank the Lord Jesus and His mercy on someone's deathbed, such as the thief on the cross, who said, remember me, Lord, when you come in your kingdom. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. But I say to you, repent, as John the Baptist said, and get ready to meet the Lord. If you agree, say Amen. amen. So John said, repent or it's too late. And then we have Jesus who shows up. Why? Why would he be a part of this? When I think of Christ coming, I think of his birth. He was uh, born in a manger, came from royalty, was born in a manger. He came from being the king of kings to, to being a fugitive along with his family running for their lives. Jesus, when he came, he came on a mission. You remember what he said? I have come to seek and save the lost. Jesus said, I have come to seek and save the lost. The church often forgets that, don't we? We think we exist to service ourselves. And that's when we run into problems. We're not here.
here to perpetuate tradition. I appreciate tradition. The tradition of Christianity, the kingdom of God, the Judaistic tradition, the word of God. I appreciate and respect the traditions of the church. But we're not here to be a museum for tradition. We are here to fulfill the mission that God has called us to. And that is to seek and save the lost. Amen. 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 And we isolate ourselves. And we hide sometimes in our holy conclaves. And I want you to see that Jesus doesn't isolate himself. We've come and think we do God a favor. God, look at me, put a star on my lapel, I'm here today. Hope the pastor sees me. Hope my Sunday school teacher sees me. Here I am. Jesus, he comes. And he being the great high priest. Such as Moses was. Moses was a form of a priest, a high priest. And Moses, he stood and he interceded for the sins of the people. We have Isaiah. He stood and said, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. And he also was interceding for the people. We have Nehemiah who went before the Lord and wanted to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And he prayed and took the sins of the people into his own heart and his own thoughts. We have Daniel who did the same. And we have Jesus Christ who comes. And he takes and identifies with the sins of the people. He's endorsing the ministry of John. But he is identifying with those who are sinners. Jesus is not isolated. He's out in the jails. He's in the prison. He's walking the halls of the hospitals. He's where families are at. He's out where people are at. The business of the church is not to come to the church and hide. The business of the church is to come and be refueled and recharged and strengthened and know what our mission is and then go outside these walls and do our mission. Amen? Amen. And Jesus, he identifies with the people. He got in trouble for that. There was a place in Luke 15, the Bible said he was eating and drinking with sinners. He was hanging out with them. He was spending time with them and they didn't like that. They wanted him to look religious and act religious. We don't do that here. Yes, we do. And Jesus then told them the parable of the lost sheep. Remember that? A man had a hundred sheep. He went out and counted and found out there were 99 sheep. There was one lost. Aren't you glad that one lost was you? And Jesus left that fold and went out and found you. Amen? And so Jesus comes down to the Jordan River. And he identifies with people who are repenting. People who are saying, I've sinned. I've done wrong. I'm sorry. I wondered out there, Jordan River, what, what, what type of confession was being made? Perhaps as John was getting ready to baptize a man, he admitted, he said, I've committed adultery. Maybe a teenager came down and said, I have stolen. Maybe someone came and said, I have, I have gossiped terribly and hurt the character of someone. And they were confessing their sins and repenting of their sins. And here is Jesus identifying with these sins. On the way home last night from our production that we saw, we watched the movie Amazing Grace about William Wilberforce. Only when William Wilberforce saw the stocks and the chains and the, the bonds that the slaves were being held in. When he got a vision at night. When he smelled the stink of death in the ships. Then he could identify. Then he could pour his life out to stop the terrible oppression of slavery. We need to get out of the church and identify where people are at. Amen. I'm so gracious for people that gather, but we gather to scatter. And when we scatter, we go out where the needs are. And Jesus identified, must I read, and I won't right now for time's sake, but if I did, we may weep. I have a hard time reading it. But Isaiah 53 talks about the suffering servant who took our sins upon himself. Just a short part of it says this. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces. 
He was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore up our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. Jesus Christ identified with sin. John looked up. Why, why are you here? Jesus Christ identified with sin. He's already praying for you and I down at the Jordan River before he's baptized. Jesus also set an example for his followers. See, one that comes down as repentant and humble, that's the life that Jesus honors. Remember the Pharisee and the tax collector, they came to pray. And the Pharisee he looked around and said, I thank you I'm not like him, and I thank you I'm not like her. I thank you that man over there, that tax collector, I thank you I'm not like him. I go to church, and I fast, and I pray, I'm so glad. But the tax collector, the Bible says, couldn't even come close. And he put down his head and beat his breast and said, have mercy on me, O oh God. Have mercy on me. One of the earliest prayers of the early church of Jesus. Have mercy, O oh God. We have Jesus here identifying. Jesus is also foreshadowing his own death, burial, and resurrection. He's also announcing that this is the beginning of his earthly ministry. John looked into the faces of people that came with guilt, people that had committed sins, and he baptized them. But he looks into the face of the spotless Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, and he baptizes him. I love that song, when others see a shepherd boy, God sees a king. When God was going to anoint a king, if you remember, they brought out all the sons of Jesse and the prophet Samuel didn't know which one. He thought the one that was tall, the one that was strong, the one that was charismatic, the one that had power, the one that seemed to have all the gifts and talents and abilities. And then he said, is there any more? And his father said, oh, there's just the youngest. He's out tending the sheep. And he had David come. And when David came, God said to the prophet, he said, that's the one. And he anointed him. Jesus Christ comes down to the Jordan River and he's about to start his ministry. There's going to be an anointing. The Bible says when he was baptized, the Holy Spirit came down in the form of a dove and landed on Jesus. This is a sign of the anointing of God upon Christ. Notice the Trinity here. We have God the Father speaking from heaven. This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. We have the Holy Spirit coming down from heaven and landing in the form of a dove upon Jesus. And we have Jesus Christ who is here being baptized. We have the Trinity all in place right here. It's a beautiful thing. The dove why a dove? You know that when the people would come to the temple to present sacrifices, those that had good money would buy a bull or a lamb. But those that didn't have any money, had hardly any money, they could always buy a dove and sacrifice a dove. And our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ identifies with those that have nothing, which is all of us. Amen. Amen. We all stand before the Lord. We all like sheep have gone astray, each one to his own way. And Jesus, as he stands there and takes our place, as he is the sinless Lamb of God, God in the flesh, he receives an anointing. The dove comes down, this is the Holy Spirit, and he receives this anointing. You know what he does next? After he's baptized, he now goes out into the wilderness and he's tempted for 40 days and 40 nights and he fasts the entire time. This is the beginning of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, His anointing. I want to remind you, the Bible says, not by might or by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. God is not blessed or strengthened by the legs of a man or a horse or power or armaments. Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane when they came with a detachment of soldiers and Peter grabbed that sword and Jesus said, put your sword away. Don't you know that I can call on my Father and I can call legions of angels to come down 
down and take care of this. But he didn't. We are often fooled. We think the power of God is manifested in numbers. I want you to know that behind the scenes, Almighty God is working miracles we don't even know about. And in the spiritual world, it's not by how big the church is. It's not by how big the buildings are. It's not by how much cash comes through the offering plate. It is the anointing of God. It is the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When you go into your prayer closet and get on your knees and pray, the power of God is released all over this world. This has nothing to do with our power or our strength. And Jesus comes and he's now being anointed by the Holy Spirit. There is nothing more than this church wants than the anointing of God's Spirit to fall fresh on us. That's what sent the church of Jesus Christ out of Jerusalem and into Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. Jesus said, don't go until the Holy Spirit comes. Let the dove come down. When the dove comes down, he will land on you with an anointing, with a power. It won't be yours. And that's why as a parent you can say, I don't know what happened to my child, but they love the Lord and I'm not responsible for this. That's why you can say in your marriage relationship, whatever happened here, this was all God. I'm amazed what God has done in my finances. Oh, I'm amazed I've prayed for that man for 20 years, and now I get an email and he says, I've come to Jesus Christ. All of this is the power of God. We take too much of it on ourselves. We need the dove of the Holy Spirit to come on us. And when Jesus was initiated into his office, then came the anointing of God. Without the Spirit of God, we will never be able to fulfill the plan of God. When I think of that dove, I think of Noah that sent a dove out. I think of those poor people that didn't have the money to sacrifice a bull or a goat. I think that Jesus wants to be accessible to the lowliest of people, to every single one of us. And I'm also reminded that there is power in gentleness. That the power of Jesus Christ and the power of the salvation of God Almighty, that He would take a meek and a lowly Savior, His Son, and would save the entire world. He didn't look very powerful when Christ was hanging and dying on the cross. And then He died. And He lay in the grave. And Satan thought His power had won the battle. But then he came bursting out of that grave and he rose again from the dead. And he's alive and he's building his church. Christianity is the fastest growing religion all over the world. The church in America gets a little discouraged because our numbers aren't where they should be. Amen. We're praying for a great spiritual awakening to take place here in America and all over the world. And God will pour out His Spirit again upon His church. Amen. And we are His church. Amen? Amen. Baptism. On this day, there stood John. Repent. The Son of God is coming. And he looks up. And there's Jesus. John says, Jesus, I can't baptize you. And Jesus said, let it be done. To fulfill all righteousness. The word there, righteousness, you know what righteousness is? That doesn't mean you're a good church attender. That's a good thing. It doesn't mean that you're this or this or that. What it means is that you are wholeheartedly following and fulfilling the will of God. That's what righteousness meant there at that place in the Bible. And so here we are, asking for the anointing of God's Spirit. There'll be people that will step forward tonight, children. Adults, and they'll go down into the water, and they'll be baptized. And it's a way of following Jesus Christ and making a public statement that Christ is the Lord of their life. Amen? Amen. 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 I'd like to invite you to bow your heads, all heads bowed. I would be very remiss here if you didn't have an opportunity yourself. To repent, confess your sin, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, 
and be saved. You could be baptized this evening. You could follow Christ and be baptized. The Lord is here right now. The Spirit of God is here in this place. Lord, we thank you that that day you walked down to the Jordan River. People were confessing their sins and repenting. There were also some that came down that were, they were hypocrites. The Pharisees, the Sadducees. And John saw that for what it was. But then he looked up and there was the Son of God. And John, feeling very inadequate, said, I can't do this, Lord. I can't do this. But you looked at him, Lord Jesus. He looked into your eyes. You looked into his eyes. And said, let this be done. Jesus, you went down into the water and you identified with our sins. You took our sins upon you. You stood with the sinner confessing even though you committed no sin. You were the spotless, sinless Lamb of God. You're our great high priest. Lord, today there may be someone that needs to turn to you. And I pray right now that they would to the joy of their soul and to be added into the kingdom and to influence and bless and be used to you. All heads bowed. Is there someone that would like to raise their hand and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved? Someone want to recommit their life to Christ and raise their hand to Him? If you would. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Are there any others? Recommit your life to Christ? Yes, thank you. Praise the Lord. If you're raising that hand to Christ, you can lower your hands. Are there any others? Amen. Jesus, we follow your example. Tonight there will be those that will come down, Lord, to the water. And they'll be baptized. They'll present themselves to be baptized. We pray to be a very special occasion in their life. We pray, dear Lord, that the baptismal waters can be stirred up again and again, not just once a year or twice a year. We pray, Father God, we have to go finish services and we can take someone down and baptize them because they've placed their faith in Christ. Remind us that the church is a place that we are to seek and save the lost. Thank you, Jesus, that you identify with us. You are our Savior. We love you. And we ask all this in your strong name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed, and we'll see you tonight at 6 o'clock. God bless you. I don't know where to go. What are you going to do about it? Sure. Sure.